Hello and welcome to another episode of the Science on the Edge podcast. I'm Dr. Mark Darcy and in today's episode we're going to be looking at the various techniques that we have for analysing and recording brain activity. So let's get started. Actually, before we get started, if any of you would like to find out a little bit more about me, um, you can follow me on Twitter. My um, handle is at Mark of the D. And if you do find these episodes engaging, then you can always go to scienceontheedge.com and click on the donate button. Keep me motivated. Okay, so let's get started. Um, Brain imaging techniques. Okay, so imaging and brain stimulation. So we're gonna talk about computed tomography, CT scans, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, positron emission tomography, PET, functional MRI, fMRI, magnetoencephalography, MEG, and transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. Okay, so computers can combine many X-ray images um, in various ways. This allows for CAT scans or CT scans, computerized axial tomography. And very software can be used to analyze those images to kind of look for things like um, brain tumors, lesions, any kind of abnormal activity, or just to look at normal activity in the brain. Computers can also measure magnetic fields given off by various structures. This is how MRI works, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, PET, positron emission at tomography, it measures an image's brain activity by using subatomic particles and guessing where they're going to go next. This uses radioactive glucose to chart activity. It's used to detect cancer, for example. Um, now EEG, electroencephalogram, uh, measures an image's electrical discharges in the brain. In this case, you basically wear a cap, a helmet, but it's got various monitors, um, electrodes that monitor electrical activity. This isn't quite as accurate as some of the other techniques, because obviously you're measuring brain activity, but you're doing it just with electrodes that are outside the skull. Um, But you can get some some very interesting information using this technique too. An fMRI, functional MRI, uh, measures and images the brain using repeated MRIs paired with radioactive chemicals, then models the brain's activity using computer models. So let's go into more detail. So CT scans, a computer-assisted X-ray procedure, that's what a CT scan is. Um, An X-ray scanner is rotated about one degree at a time over 180 degrees. The computer then reconstructs um, that data into an image. It provides um, data in horizontal sections of the brain, and it can reveal structural abnormalities such as cortical atrophy or lesions caused by a stroke or trauma, so a very useful technique. MRI scans, in this case, a strong magnetic field causes hydrogen atoms to align in the same orientation. When a radio frequency wave is passed through the head, atomic nuclei emit electromagnetic energy. The MRI scanner is tuned to detect radiation emitted from the hydrogen molecules. A computer then reconstructs this image. Um, Let's compare MRI with CT scans. The advantages of MRI, there's no ionizing radiation exposure. This is a big advantage in terms of safety. Um, You get better spatial resolution. You get horizontal, frontal, or sagittal planes, meaning you can look at the brain from pretty much any angle. Disadvantages are cost. MRI scanners are very expensive. um, So cost can be an issue with MRI. When it comes to positron emission tomography, PET, PET scans, um, a positron emitting radionucleotide, so radioactive, is injected, for example, um, 2-deoxyglucose, so glucose. Um, Glucose, sugar, 
is obviously used um, to generate energy in the body. And parts of the brain that um, are using a lot of sugar are obviously very active parts of the brain. So you can basically measure activity of the brain. If you inject um, a radionucleotide of deoxyglucose, it will be taken up by cells. Um, and you can therefore measure the density of the radioactive signal in different parts of the brain and see which parts of the brain are active during different tasks. So positrons interact with electrons, which produce photons, gamma rays, traveling in opposite directions. PET scanners detect the photons. A computer determines how many gamma rays are emitted from a particular region of the brain, and a map is generated showing areas of high to low activity. So for example, which areas of the brain are active um, when performing certain tasks or when certain emotions are being exhibited, et cetera, et cetera. Very useful. Let's go into a bit more detail. More specifically, um, PET involves injection of radioactive tracers. Um, these, um, these resemble compounds of biological interest, for example, um, to deoxyglucose. Um, these are then detected um, with detectors around the head. These traces can be traced in the brain, e.g. to monitor met metabolic activity in those regions of the brain. PET imaging of brain activity and chemical neurotransmission. You can see some images here of what it looks like. Here we're looking at dopamine transporter. So a dopamine transporter, um, dopamine receptors, dopamine metabolism. So in Parkinson's disease, there's a problem with this. And um, with Parkinson's disease, dopamine levels drop. You need dopamine for your brain to function properly and for you to operate your muscles properly. Um, as dopamine levels drop, um, there are issues. So in this case, um, we're looking at DAT in the striatum. This reflects degeneration of dopaminergic fibers that express this particular transporter. More binding of dopamine receptor specific tracer reflects less dopamine release that could displace tracer from a receptor. Some regions, hypo, others hyperactive, um, this changes across the course of the disease. So you can see here the normal brain and the Parkinson's brain, and you can see the difference in dopamine transporters, in dopamine receptors, and in glucose metabolism as the condition develops. So very useful for looking at diseases, normal activity and abnormal activity. Let's compare um, PET with CAT scans. CAT scans shown show brain structures. PET scans reveal brain activity. CAT involves absorption of X-rays. PET involves emission of radiation by an injected or inhaled isotope. Now let's look at MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, images are generated from magnetic resonance MR signal that emanates from hydrogen nuclei in brain tissue when these are aligned by a strong magnetic field and then excited by magnetic pulse. There's different types of MRI. We have structural MRI. So this is uh, structural MRI of the brain. This is non-invasive imaging of brain structures based on MRI contrast between different tissue types due to different density of densities of hydrogen nuclei. Then we have functional MRI, fMRI. This is non-invasive imaging of the brain activity based on MR signal changes associated with metabolic and cerebral blood flow changes. This most common method is based on changes in the blood oxygen um, level dependent MR signal, known as a bold signal. Both have different uses, both are very useful. Um, start with functional MRI. Images, this images um, brain hemodynamics, the advantages over PET scans, no injections needed to be given, structure and function can be determined, um, shorter imaging time, better spatial resolution, and you get 3D images. Um, you get temporal resolution with the other method of MRI, but spatial resolution is good for the fMRI. Magnetoencephalography, MEG. Let's look at this now. MEG measures changes in magnetic fields on the scalp surface that are produced by changes in patterns of neural activity. 
the advantages of um, MEG over fMRI, faster temporal resolution. So basically, you can see changes over time, over very small amounts of time, which you don't really get with the fMRIs. That's better for spatial resolution. Advantages over EEG, um, greater accuracy and more reliable localization due to minimal distortion of the signal, which you do get with EEG because of the presence of a skull between the brain and the electrodes. The clinical uses of MEG, evaluation of things like epilepsy to localize the source of um, epileptiform brain activity, usually performed with simultaneous EEG to get the best of both worlds. Now let's look at transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. So when we get to um, the more experimental procedures, um, TMS disrupts neural activity by creating a magnetic field under a coil positioned near the skull. Disruption of specific cortical locations are produced while participants engage in cognitive and or behavioral tasks. This allows researchers to assess functions of a specific cortical area. So, for example, um, you want to determine um, how vision works. Well, vision is controlled by the occipital lobe at the back of the brain, and you have strips of neurons that are involved in different types of visual activity. For example, certain strips are involved in determining the difference between um, the difference between uh, uh, foreground and background, or movement, or or, or shade and um, uh, contour, and all the other sorts of things. So basically, different parts of of visual perception are determined by different strips of the um, occipital lobe. And this has been proven because if you use things like TMS, you can disrupt certain strips. For example, if you disrupt a particular strip of the occipital lobe, then color vision will disappear. The color will drain out of vision and you will just be seeing black and white and gray, which shows you that there's a region of the brain of the occipital lobe involved in color vision. And obviously you can use this for um, determining perceptions. For example, if you disrupt areas of the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe, you get all sorts of interesting perceptions that are experienced by um, the subject. For example, they can become disembodied, feel like they're having an out-of-body experience, feel a presence in the room, even though there is no presence in the room, feel more or less connected to the world around them. Quite interesting technique. Okay, so that was a very brief overview. Of, um, of these brain analysis techniques. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about um, this area, then I have a couple of other um, YouTube episodes that are related to this subject. For example, I have an interesting episode about the default mode network and the target positive network. Um, if you scroll through my videos, you'll, you'll see that. Um, okay, so thanks for listening. And once again, if you want to know more about me, then just follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Mark of the D. Um, or you can visit my website, scienceontheedge.com. And if you really are, do like my um, episodes, then feel free to donate by going to the donate button on scienceontheedge.com. Thank you for listening, and I'll speak to you next time. Goodbye for now. Goodbye.